this is session nine, the 12th session course of saving maternal lives, obstetric emergencies, maternal shock, maternal collapse. We're discussing everything in details. Today, we will talk about disseminated intravascular coagulation. And actually, this um, is just the session following resuscitation. And I want to be very clear about this, that acidosis has no treatment. Disseminated intravascular coagulation. We'll talk about causes, we'll talk about presentation, we'll talk about everything. But when we come to treatment, there is no treatment. So the two causes, direct causes of tissue damage and maternal death, acidosis and DIC, have no specific treatment. The only treatment available is treatment of the cause. So again, this gives you an insight about the importance of treating the cause of shock. We cannot keep chasing the pathology. I have to put a roadblock from the start of shock. And again, the start of shock is presence of a shock eliciting event, not deficient tissue perfusion. These few words that I have said can save many lives if you fully understand and fully respect this concept. Now, DIC, we have four types of DIC. The first type is hyperfibrinolysis. There is increase in the fibrinolytic activity of blood. And in this type, the main symptom is bleeding. So blood form, blood clotting factors are there, platelets are there, blood is able to form a clot, but it is not sustained because there is hyperfibrinolysis. So if there is a wound or anything in this patient, she will bleed. And this happens usually in cases of leukemia and in pregnancy due to increased uh, plasma activity. But in pregnancy, it's balanced with the hypercoagulable state. But I have witnessed two cases of postpartum hemorrhage with hyperfibrinolysis. The problem is not in the clotting factors or platelets. The problem is blood clots are not sustained. So the patient keeps on bleeding although the uterus is contracted and we don't have uh, evidence of consumptive coagulopathy. So it is there, it's rare, it's rare, but you may come across it. The second is when there is hypercoagulation, but this coagulation is occurring rightfully. It's not occurring in a healthy vessel. It's occurring due to endothelial cell damage or due to stimulation of the coagulation factors by injury. And in such a case, the fibrinolytic system will not be activated to lyse this clot. And the primary symptom here is not bleeding. The primary symptom is organ failure. And this is what you see in cases of sepsis. In cases of sepsis, the interleukins, the histones will stimulate or will lead to apoptosis and endothelial cell damage like in preeclampsia. And so there is blood clotting and the fibrinolytic system is not lysing the clot. And thus the main symptom is organ failure. This gives you an insight why multi-organ dysfunction occurs in severe sepsis and it may occur early because of the type of DIC present which is the hypercoagulability. And then we have another type of DIC. Both the fibrinolytic system and the ovulation system are working at the same time, and both are working strongly. They are stimulated by a trigger, which is usually the thromboplastin. And this is the consumptive coagulopathy. This is the type that we see in obstetrics. The, the clotting systems are consumed, the, cl the clotting factors, the platelets, the fibrinogen, everything is consumed and bleeding from everywhere. These patients are the patients you see after major, major hemorrhage, shock, and in our obstetric uh, patients, because our obstetric patients have a hypercoagulable state and a strong fibrinolytic stimulated fibrinolytic system. So both system, if, if there is a trigger for intravascular coagulation, then you have the, the consumptive coagulopathy, the DIC that we are talking about. And there is a stage which is subclinical, which is the pre-DIC. Before the patient goes into DIC, 
the both systems will be working but they are still weak they are not working in full strength there is a mild stimulus and this mild stimulus leads to abnormal lab parameters where there are no symptoms there is no presentation but the lab results are uh, abnormal so these are the four types of DIC so our disseminated intervascular coagulopathy is a systemic secondary coagulopathy systemic means it occurs in the whole body and secondary means that it can never be primary there must be a cause and it is a consumptive type of DIC it's not the fibrinolytic type it's not the hypercoagulant type it's a consumptive type and the causes will be release of thromboplastin into the circulation, either because of abruption of amniotic fluid embolism of intratriumph fetal death or fetal demise, which is retained, gestational trophoblastic diseases with release of thromboplastin, and rupture of the uterus. And then we have prolonged shock state. Any prolonged shock state or bleeding will lead to consumptive coagulopathy, even in, uh, after bleeding after major surgery. And then infection, as we said before, sepsis or severe sepsis and then injury to endothelial cells and here comes the eclampsia and the preeclampsia the two major problems and sepsis of course because sepsis leads to injury of endothelial cells a red blood cell or platelet injury and this will occur in transfusion reactions so sometimes if you give a wrong transfusion reaction you can induce hypercoagulable DIC and acute fatty liver with pregnancy so DIC is always secondary and these are the causes of DIC. I want you to have a look at the coagulation cascade. Here this arrow denotes if this factor or element increases in pregnancy as one of the pregnancy adaptations or not. So you will see that all coagulation factors are increased. And then if it's like this, then this does not increase or decrease. Like the prothrombin, the antithrombin, protein C, they don't increase in pregnancy. They are almost the same. Platelets decrease in pregnancy, protein S uh, activity decreases in pregnancy. This is the anticoagulant. So actually pregnancy is a hypercoagulant state because you have clotting factors increased and protein S activity decreased, which means that the way is paved for blood to clot. But the fibrinolytic system, the plasminogen activity is increased. And so plasmin will break a blood clot that is formed. If plasmin comes into action, it actually breaks the insoluble fibrin, so it releases D-dimer. So sometimes you have, or usually one of the causes of increased D-dimer is pregnancy. So in pregnancy we have hypercoagulable state, but the fibrinolytic activity of the blood is also increased. The second thing is that thromboplastin is actually formed of two things, tissue factor and phospholipids. Thromboplastin is used in the test, prothrombin test. In the partial thromboplastin time, we use the phospholipids present in the thromboplastin, not the whole thromboplastin. So if you, are, if you want to test for DIC which occurs in pregnancy due to release of thromboplastin, prothrombin time will be a more accurate reflection of the problem. The partial thromboplastin time may be prolonged later in the sequence of the disease. But early you will find the one prolonged is the prothrombin time because we use thromboplastin to test for the prothrombin time. Thromboplastin activates the extrinsic and the common pathway. Partial thromboplastin, which are the phospholipids, will stimulate the intrinsic pathway and the common pathway. And we cover the PT, the PTT, the INR in early sessions in this lecture. So by now you should have understood the difference between PT, PTT and INR, but I'm just summarizing it. What is the pathophysiology? What actually happened? What actually happened is that you have in your blood, you have the, pl the platelets, the clotting factors and the fibrinogen. And then here comes a stimulus, which is the thromboplastin. The thromboplastin will lead to diffuse activation of coagulation. So a blood clot forms. And this blood clot, when it forms, the body will not leave it alone. The fibrinolytic system comes into play and it, li it causes lysis of the blood clot. But already there is some ischemic organ damage have occurred. The lysis of the clot will lead to release of fibrin degradation products. Fibrin degradation products, by the way, 
are both anticoagulant and tocolytic. So if you are talking about postpartum hemorrhage, this patient has gone into massive postpartum. Uh, she's already bleeding and reached the IC, but with the IC, there is more tocolysis. So now the clinical features will be the main symptoms and signs are those of the cause of the obstetric cause that led to the IC because the IC is never primary. And then the thrombotic sequence which occurred led to ischemic organ damage. So you may have organ dysfunction and hemorrhage. If there is any place the patient can bleed from, then there will be hemorrhage. And the blood which is coming out is not clotting outside the body. So it's not, there are no blood clots coming. And the blood which is coming is fluidy and it's watery like and because of decreased viscosity and it's not clotting outside. There are bioassays which you can clinically do in the labor world. You take two milliliters of blood, you put them in a test tube and you wait for 20 minutes and the test tube is in the upright position. There should be a clot for and the clot should be strong. So if you tilt the tube, the clot is holding, no problem. But if you tilt the tube and you find that no blood clot is formed after 20 minutes upright position or the blood clot which is formed is degraded, this means that I have a coagulopathy. Another test which is very useful is the thromboelastometry and thromboelastography. Thromboelastometry is that the blood, just a pin is put in the blood and the pin rotates very, 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 very fast and so a blood clot forms around the pin. In the thromboelastography, the pin is stable and the cup is the one which is rotating. All lectures are based on Togaville textbook, your one-stop, postgraduate study source, and decision support platform. You have 14-day free full access trial. Follow the link in the description to start your trial. Remember to hit the subscribe button, and if you find this video useful, please like and share. And then, a clot forms around the pin. What we, what is important about this is the alpha angle, this angle, the angle between the pin and the blood clot, and the width or the volume of the blood clot formed. So this is normal. This is, there is anticoagulation. There is a factor deficiency because the blood clot receded backwards. And this is platelet inhibition or hypofibrinogenemia. You have a very thin clot. The volume is reduced. And the angle, the alpha angle is obtuse. It's not like this one, 90 degrees. It's obtuse. Hyperfibrinolysis is when a blood clot is formed and then lysis starts to occur from backwards. So it does not have a uniform shape. It has a teardrop shape. This gives you an idea. There is hyperfibrinolysis. And if the volume is increased, this is hypercoagulability. So this is the thromboelastometry or thromboelastography. I know they are not very commonly used in uh, our hospitals, but I just want to explain. And then we have the investigations, the lab findings. The lab findings, we said the symptoms that we will have, the main symptoms, those of the obstetric cause. And we have the thrombos, uh, thrombotic sequel, which is the organ uh, dysfunction, and the hemorrhagic manifestations, which can be seen by biopsy. In the lab, what we have? First of all, the platelets. The platelet count, they are consumed. So the platelet count, either there is thrombocytopenia or progressive decline in platelet counts. Well, definition of thrombocytopenia is if the count is below 100,000 uh, and 75,000 in some textbooks. Uh, a number below 100,000 is definitely thrombocytopenia, but a dangerous number is below 50,000 and below 50,000 is seen in 50% of cases of the IC or a progressively falling platelet count like it was 150,000, 180,000 then came down to 150,000, came down to 120,000 so we are talking about progressive falling platelet count this also means that they are consumed and then the fibrinogen the fibrinogen normally it's 300 to 600 milligram percent if it comes below 200 milligram percent, then this is hypofibrinogenemia. If it comes below 150 milligram percent, then the blood will have a problem in forming a clot. If it's below 100 milligram percent, this is DIC. This is over DIC. Of course, if it's below 50 milligram percent, this is a severe case of hypofibrinogenemia. So platelets are consumed, 
and fibrinogen is consumed. And the clotting factors are consumed. Clotting factors, we do PT, PTT, INR. And the most sensitive is PT because prothrombin time is actually tested by thromboplastin itself. So it is the first to be affected. And then the fibrin degradation products. Fibrin degradation products are the degradation products of fibrin. Fibrin degradation products. But D dimer is not the degradation of fibrin. It's the degradation of an insoluble fibrin clot. After it has formed and after factor 13 was activated and cross-linked fibrin and monomers together. So if it is broken, this means you are talking about the full picture of the IC. There is a break of insoluble fibrin clot. So that's why D dimer is very important. Fibrin degradation products, if they are above 40 microgram per milliliter, confirm the IC. And D dimer, if it's above 0.5 microgram per milliliter, here 0.5, then this means that we have a D IC. And then the thromboelastometry and thromboelastography and other tests, blood film or blood smear, whatever. And of course, one of the tests that must be done is the organ dysfunction tests, creatinine, liver functions, liver enzymes, because these are a sequel of the thrombotic activity of the uh, disseminated intravascular coagulants. So these are the investigations. The lab findings, as I said, the FDPs are the lysis of fibrinogen or the lysis of a, a, a soluble fibrin clot. But in soluble fibrin clot, this is the one which releases D dimer. So D dimer is the most important to be measured in cases of DIC. Next, we have the scoring system of the scoring of DIC from the International Society on Thrombosis and Homeostasis. Now, the scoring system starts by saying, does the patient have an underlying disorder known to be associated with over DIC? If yes, proceed. If no, don't use this score. Why? Because DIC is never primary. So this is just for scoring DIC, which is always secondary. So don't use it to score any other bleeding disorder. So this system only scores DIC. We have the zero, which marks that everything is within normal values. Platelet count more than 100,000, PT more than three seconds. The FDPs are less than uh, 10 microgram per milliliter and the fibrinogen level is above the uh, least or the minimum which is 100 milligram percent and then as the things become worse the platelet count if it's less than 100,000 or the uh, PT time and and notice that the scoring system has the prothrombin time only it doesn't score PTT or INR because we said that PT is the most specific for cases of DIC. So if it's three to six seconds, this scores one. If the fibrinogen is less than 100 milligram percent, this scores one. And then score of two is if the platelets are below 50,000. If there is moderate increase in FDPs, but still less than 40 micrograms per milliliter. And if the PT time is more than six seconds, this scores two. Score 3 is only if there is strong rise in FDPs more than 40 micrograms per milliliter. If you have score 5 or more, this means that this is over DIC. If the score is less than 5, this means that it is a preclinical DIC, pre-DIC. You remember uh, the four types? Well, if the score is below 5, then this is the pre-DIC, the non-symptomatic DIC. So this is the phase before the patient goes into over DIC. So, so now, now what, what is, is the treatment, treatment of the IC? If, if we, we have, have a case of the IC, what, what is the treatment? Well, actually, there, there is a consumption choreography. So, so what we have is we have low patients, low clotting factors, low fibrinogen. We have thromboplastin here, and we have the fibrinolytic system active. So logically, sometimes some some of the physicians just replace the deficient products. They replace the platelets. They replace the clotting factors. Now they have done the job. Everything is replaced. You have high platelet count and the clotting factors are great. What the body does is that it takes these platelets and clotting factors and with the thromboplastin present, it will reform blood loss. So again, you have, you have a thrombotic event. 
and this thrombotic event will lead to more organ damage. And the fibrinolytic system will not just uh, stand on the side watching, it will break down this blood clot, giving more fibrin degradation products. So you increase the fibrin degradation products, you increase the ischemic organ damage. And again, the platelets are consumed and the clotting factors are consumed and the fibrinogen is consumed. So actually have done nothing. It was better if you did not replace or replenish the uh, products which are consumed. Because when you replenish them without treating the cause, the body will just take them, form another clot, and the clot will be lysed. So replenishing the deficient products is not a solution. Some doctors, you just, okay, she has low platelets, give platelets. She has a, a prolonged PT, give clot, in fact, give fresh frozen plasma. And we replace fibrinogen as well. But what have you gained? Nothing. You gave the body a fuel. You are adding fuel to the fire. So more fire is there. You give the body the, the, the clotting factors and the fibrinogen and the uh, platelets and the body will just form, reform blood clots. And when it reforms blood clots, the fibrinolytic system breaks it again. And so all you have done is you increase the organ damage and you have increased the fibrin degradation products. So this is not the correct solution. The correct solution is that you have to remove thromboplastin from the equation. Treat the cause. After you treat the cause, you can replenish whatever you want. You can give the platelets, the fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, whatever. But you have to treat the cause first. And I tell you, all patients of DIC that I have treated, that I have seen, we went into surgery immediately. DIC is no contraindication to surgery. Once we remove the placenta, just put out, compress the wounds, and wait for 10 minutes. I promise you the blood will re-clot even if you don't give any replacements. It will clot. There is an inherent power in the body to reform all these clotting factors and to reform the platelets. Your main objective is to maintain perfusion. Clotting factors are synthesized in the liver, endothelial cells, platelets, and recently this is debatable. They are also synthesized in many cells in the body, fibroblasts, alveolar cells, many other cells. So if you can maintain perfusion, adequate perfusion, all these organs and cells will start to form clotting factors. So it is mandatory to perform vigorous replacement as we said before. Give packed RBCs. And if you have fresh frozen plasma transfer, and the patient will be fine. But without removing the thromboplastin, there is no treatment. And this is the latest publication, 2022. It says that, is there, uh, are there clinical signs of DIC? Yeah, what is, what do you do? What is the first thing? Delivery of the patient. Delivery of the patient. This is your first step in treatment. If you don't do this and the placenta is still inside, this patient has no hope to live. So, again, treatment of DIC. The management is stop the ongoing consumption. It's a priority to treat the cause and then give your replacement with fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, platelet concentrate, just give the replacement. But first you have to treat the cause and vigorous restoration of perfusion by packed RBCs is mandatory. It is very important in order to help the perfused tissues to resynthesize the uh, clotting factors and the reticular endothelial system to remove all the victims of war, all the uh, fibrin degradation products, the activated uh, uh, coagulation factors, fibrin. So it's mandatory to do perfusion. These two steps, is there any debate about them? No. All guidelines, the Williams edition, 2050 edition, obstetric hemorrhage, the British, the Italian, the Japanese, all guidelines of hematology and of obstetrics do not doubt these two steps. So if a patient comes in DIC, you have to start with the packed RBCs in order to maintain perfusion and while the OT is prepared and then you go to OT and when you remove the placenta or remove the cause of sepsis or whatever, you start giving the replacement with fresh frozen plasma and the platelet concentrate. And we give the massive transfusion protocol if it's a, if it's a bleeding DIC, 
according to the clinical condition, clinical state of the patient, as we said, in the session of the resuscitation, where DIC was the, the step number eight. That's why it's number eight here. So you restore 641, six packed RBCs, fresh frozen plasma four units, one unit plated concentrate, and when volume is restored, you start to do the fine tuning with the second step, lab guided replacement. Other forms of treatment, heparin. Heparin, of course, is not used in any bleeding type of DIC, which are the types we have. It is used in the hypercoagulable type, the one with sepsis and the patient is not bleeding. In these patients, therapeutic doses of heparin or low molecular weight heparin, which seems to be superior, are used. But for all patients of DIC, there is a risk of uh, venous, th venous thromboembolism. So we can give thromboprophylaxis after the condition and the bleeding is controlled. You give the thromboprophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin, heparin, and up to the patient's bleeding stops, you have to use the mechanical compression stockings. The antifibrinolytic agents are not used in our types of DIC. It is used in the hyperfibrinolytic type. Because if you use the antifibrinolytics, well, the fibrinolytic system is doing its job. It is doing lysis of the blood clots form in order to avoid organ damage. So you cannot risk giving antifibrinolytics and go into organ damage. So we only give the antifibrinolytics in the, the like tr uh, tranexamic acid in the event of hyperfibrinolysis. It is recommended in bleeding patients with hyperfibrinolytic system, like patients with postpartum hemorrhage, as I told you in the introduction of this lecture in the first slide, patients with postpartum hemorrhage where you do not, there is no DIC, the platelets are okay, the clotting factors are okay, there is, you, you, you are not diagnosing DIC, she's a bleeding postpartum hemorrhage. Tranexamic acid may be life-saving because Pregnancy is hyperfibrinolytic, so we don't use them in the IC. No, we don't. We don't use them in the IC. We use them in bleeding conditions where there is no DIC. We can use tranexamic acid. And then, activated factor seven, recombinant factor seven, because the tissue factor, as we said, thromboplastin activates the extrinsic system. So the most the major factor which is consumed is factor 7. So if we have factor 7 activated, we can give. But not recommended yet because there are not enough uh, RCT randomized controlled uh, studies. The anti-activated factor 10, fondaparinox and danaparoid, inhibit the activated factor 10. They inhibit clot formation. These agents significantly, significantly will reduce DVT, but in DIC cannot be used in a bleeding patient, of course. Synthetic protease inhibitors. The synthetic protease inhibitors, they inhibit many things. They inhibit the uh, kinase and the interleukin interaction with the coagulation system, but still we don't have trials to recommend their use. Although they have the advantage of mild anticoagulant activity and mild antifibrinolytic activity. So in cases of bleeding DIC, there may be used and there are some of the guidelines would recommend them in massive bleeding or in bleeding uh, DIC. The natural protease inhibitors, they are strong anticoagulants and no studies to recommend their use. And treatment with recombinant, human, activated protein C. Protein C is an anticoagulant. It, there are two forms of protein C. One is the recombinant and one is the natural, the plasma driven. And the antithrombin. These three agents, they work as anticoagulants. There is no recommendation to use them in the IC. All the recommendations are based mostly on patients of sepsis. But so in sepsis, in the hypercoagulable type, in the type with organ failure, they may be recommended. But for us, treatment of the cause, adequate perfusion, good replacement are the keys to patient's life.
don't think that you can treat the IC without removing the cause of the IC. This is the summary table for the recommendations of treatment. The untreatment of the underlying factor is a recommendation in all types and by all guidelines. Blood transfusion is recommended in all types by all guidelines except in the non-symptomatic if it's not bleeding. But if it's bleeding, then you have to give the replacement. Heparin is not recommended. Not in the consumptive type, not in the bleeding type. So it's not recommended for us. Except if sepsis and there is no bleeding. Antifactor 10 is not recommended bleeding type or in the massive bleeding type. May be recommended in the non-symptomatic type. And then the synthetic protease inhibitors. They are recommended in the bleeding type and in the massive bleeding type because they are weak anticoagulants and weak antifibrinolytics while the natural protease inhibitors are recommended in the organ failure type but not recommended if there is bleeding the antifibrinolytic treatment is not recommended in the organ failure type because they will prevent fibrinolysis and increase organ failure and they are recommended in the bleeding type which is the hyperfibrinolysis type and not recommended in the massive bleeding type, the consumptive coagulopathy, because of the organ failure, same as the organ, because part of it is organ failure, so it's also not recommended, and not recommended in the non-symptomatic type. So what is the message that we take home from this session? Don't wait all this time. You just start here. Shock enlisting event, you start running, so you can beat this small, tiny shock event. But as shock increases and becomes more wild and more vicious, it is very hard. See what happened to you? Actions you will take are too small and too late. You are here. The actions you will take will have trivial event, trivial effect, unless you remove the cause. I'm not saying this so that you stop treatment or something. No, no, no. You, you treat, but you treat what? You treat the cause. All the way, if you treat the cause, you will stop you will control the shock state when i control the shock i'm giving the patient the chance to fight for her life and believe me patients fight for their lives like hell they are very strong just remove the cause if you remove the cause you stop at this point and the patient is still alive she will survive in shock she will not die but if you keep watching the patient till death what can i do for you Okay, so this is the IC. I hope we fight more for maternal lives and we have the idea very clear that we fight by treating the cause surgically in the critically ill patient. It's not a contraindication. Next, we start session 10, the cardiopulmonary resuscitation.